Good evening. Glad that you are here this evening to be with us. We are in Psalm 68. You want to turn me down about a half? You already did? Awesome. Um, glad that you were here. Uh, I do want to say something. I am extremely loud tonight pretty much for a reason. Uh, we are two weeks into our sound system, and our sound system is pretty good. If you haven't noticed, uh, we got new speakers up. The old speakers are, are gone. Those have been moved. Somebody probably didn't even notice that. Uh, those are not there. But one of the things I want to encourage you to do, and I'm going to say this again on Sunday, the way that sound works is very, very interesting. It's kind of like water. You can get a focal point, but it's still going to depend upon the person hearing it or water, the person drinking it. Um, <clears throat> what I mean by that is uh, some people like certain kinds of water. Some people don't like certain kinds of water. I have a friend who hates the, the Dasani water from Coca-Cola. He, he will not drink it. He'd rather drink dirt. And, uh, and I don't know the difference in that. Sounds kind of like that. I know what I can hear. Like I can hear myself bouncing off that back wall right now. But some people can't, and, and it's okay. And so here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. I'm going to encourage you, number one, I know this is kind of crazy. Number one, just try to listen just a little bit. Uh, number two is you may have to, and I know this is like Bible stuff we're talking now. You may have to change your seat. Uh, it's just, it's just kind of one of those things. You may, may want to try a different pew to see if you can hear a little bit better. And I know that's, I, I know that's, what's that, Bob? I know we can't get that radical, Bob, but we, we may have to. And if you don't want to, so, so here's my caveat to that. Since Bob doesn't want to get that radical, what you may have to do is lean a little bit to one way. <laughs> See if that helps, or lean backwards, or just put your hands like this, or we'll get you one of those Civil War kind of ear horn things. Um, but so everything is, everything is set. There's been tests run. There's been all that kind of fun stuff. So I just want to encourage you in, in, in that regard. So we're up a little bit tonight. They're going to probably turn me down. Uh, sound people are interesting. They have an ability just to go, and you're done. Um, Sunday morning, the batteries just died. So that's what that was on Sunday morning. That was nobody's fault but the batteries. So they were used two times and, and just died. So that's kind of where we're at. But we're going to be in Psalm 68. So if you're not there, I would encourage you to get there. We have been there for a few weeks. And one of the things where we've been in Psalm 68 is we're going through this outline, this outline of, of really where we're at. And we're going to be about number four tonight. We're going to pick up in verse 19. But we're going to, we're going to go pretty fast through 19 and get to 24 then we're going to try to finish Psalm 68 out tonight. But to be able to do that, I, I, I want to start us in a different place. And the place I want to start us off is, is I want to start us off with asking the question, is when you think of congregational singing, like what are the songs that come to your mind? Like if, if you think congregational singing, like what are those songs that first pop in your, in your mind? Any songs. When I say congregational singing, what, what songs pops in your, in your mind? Trust and obey? What did you, what'd you say, Rick? All right, your favorite, what, what, what are our favorite songs? Amazing Grace? What did you say? Oh, Faith and Praise? I thought you said Amazing Grace. Robert just likes the whole book. What, what other songs pop into your mind? All right, Have Thine Own Way. What else pops into your mind? Rock of Ages. Okay. Kneel at the Cross. Okay. What do those songs have to do with that we like so much about them? Let's take Amazing Grace, for instance. I, I'm assuming that most people like Amazing Grace. Uh, I have a friend who doesn't like it, and, and I pray for him. Um, it, it, there's, a, there's a family story behind it. But with a song like Amazing Grace, why do people like it? Okay, see, it's the old standby. We sing it a hundred years, all right. But it, it is one of those. That's that's the old standby. Pretty much everybody knows it. Even those who aren't members of the church know "Amazing Grace." What else about that song kind of resonates with you? What's that? Okay, okay. What else resonates with you about "Amazing Grace"? Uh, 
Do, do you know all the verses? There's, we usually have like four or five in our songbook. Uh, some, sometimes there's like eight or nine. Okay, God's power and display, okay. The history of it, okay. All the stadiums he filled. This is the invitation song of Billy Graham for a lot of people. And, and you know, when we think of those, those songs that we hear, those songs that we like, what becomes very interesting is, is like we know the words, and we sometimes we know, as Jones says, we know the story behind them. But what's very interesting is I would, I would change that question and ask you to think about this for the next couple weeks. What song do you like because you think you're in it? Let me, th- let me say that again. Like what song do you like because you think you're in it? It's like it's written for you. It's like it's got that momentary, hey, I, I, I hear myself in this song. Uh, there, there's a lot of songs that we can, that we can feel uh, like that song is written for us. And the reason I say that is when we get into Psalm 68, there's this belief, there's this very big belief that in the Jewish line of thinking, combining all of these together made it more, you know, combining several songs, as we mentioned, made it more meaningful. But also this was a temple song. This was part of that procession. But it also told of the history of it. So as as they would read through here, it would be part of their history that they're singing about, not just, not just another psalm by David, not just another psalm about, you know, the Lord being their shepherd. I'm not downplaying that. But here's our history that's attached to this. Here's the power of the God that we serve. Here's our story in a song. And, you know, it, it, it can resonate a little bit different. So we'll look at some of that tonight. But I, I do want to pray before we get into our class. We've got two requests. Um, this evening outside of our bulletin, um, uh, Janice handed me a note that said Timothy East fell and he broke his arm. Also, he's got a concussion, and he's going to be having surgery on March 29th, and they're going to put a plate in. So continue to remember Timothy um, in your prayers. Uh, also today, uh, I was asked just an hour ago, 45 minutes ago, um, by someone who's not religious that if we could pray for them. And uh, asked if, if our congregation would pray for them. So I, I told them we would pray for them. And, um, and her name is Taylor. And she just asked if we would pray for her, that she would greatly appreciate that. She's got some struggles in her life. So I told her that we would do that as well. So let's bow in a moment of prayer before we get into uh, our Bible study as well. Our Father and our God, we come before you tonight, Father, and we ask that, that you'll be with us. We ask that you'll be with our our Bible study, that all can go well, that we can discuss things concerning your word. Father, as we dig into this psalm, may, may we dig in with hope, may we dig in with excitement in knowing that your word is before us. And Father, as we do such, may we be motivated, may we, we, we be encouraged as we go throughout this evening and throughout our lives, knowing, Father, that you are watching over us to protect us, and, and we give you all the praise and all the glory. Father, also tonight we come to you asking that you'll be with those that we've mentioned throughout our services this week, those listed in our bulletin. Father, you will watch over them, that you can heal them. Father, if they have a medical issue, that you'll be with the doctors and nurses that are attending to them and and helping them out. Father, I also pray that you'll be with Timothy, that you'll watch over him and and his fall and his broken arm and his concussion, Father, help him to heal, and we know that he's going for surgery uh, next week, and we pray that the surgery will be successful, and we pray that uh, the doctors can use the abilities given that you've given to them to, to heal him. Father, we pray for Taylor. We don't know everything happening in her life, but we do pray for her as she has asked us as a body of believers to pray for her, and, and we do so tonight, Father, and, and as we do such, may we be a light to individuals around us. Father, may they see you working through us, but most of all, may we approach your throne of grace, and may you help us in our time of need and in others' time of, times of need as well. Father, once again, thank you for loving us and being with us this evening. We ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Um, as we look through uh, this psalm again, I, I, I want to go back to this outline, if I can, just for a moment. And, and the reason is, is I want to just let this kind of stick in your head as the, as the where we're at. We're going to be at number four tonight, and we're going to talk about the blessings of God. 
But one of those things is we talked about rejoicing in God. At the very beginning, uh, I mentioned this word. If you go back to verse 1, it says, May God arise, let his enemies be scattered, and those who hate him shall flee before him. That's part of the processional in Numbers chapter 10 that brings the Ark of the Covenant through. So you have these words, and you have them repeated. We're going to get down to verse 24, and in some translations it says, Your procession is seen, O God, the procession of my God, uh, my King, into the sanctuary. And it describes this. So it takes this history, and it describes it. So that's part of the rejoicing. We've talked about the praise that's offered to God. We've talked about God's power on display. But now it's really to talk about the blessings of God. So in verse 19, this is something that, that we have as a blessing from God. And we mentioned it either last week or week before. And one of the things we mentioned is God's protection. You know, the, to be able to be protected by God is an absolute blessing. You know, when we approach God asking him to be with us, we're asking God to protect us, not just to kind of stand there, but to actively be involved. And it says, Blessed be uh, the Lord who daily bears us up, that God is our salvation. Now notice verse 20, Our God is a God of salvation, and to God the Lord belong the deliverances from death. It's talking about us. Our deliverances of death are, come, you know, we're, we're delivered from death because of God, because he's our salvation. Verse 21, but God will strike the heads of his enemies, the hairy crown of him who walks in his guilty ways. The Lord said, I will bring them back from Bashan. I will bring them back from the depths of the sea, that you may strike your feet in their blood. The tongues of your dogs may have the portion from the foe. It, it's the image there. If you can create an image in your mind, I, I know that usually, that typically, about 90% of people think visually. So if you, if you draw pictures in your brain or if you picture the scene, picture the scene of destruction and even God bringing back their enemies to show them. Okay, that, that, that's a pretty gruesome picture. And, and I look this up at the end. To strike your feet in their blood and the tongues of your dogs shall have their portion from the foe. That's literally like a kick in the head. Like, the blood's pouring out, and you're going to see it, and it's going to be present that nobody messes with God. Now, once again, whose God is it? It's the Israelites' God. It's a God that's been with them the entire time. So it's the Israelites' God from, from history we know, and God has crushed his enemies. That's why at verse 1, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. God's going to take care of you. The, the transition part to verse 24 is the imagery of the battle is over and here comes the victorious procession. Here comes the soldiers back from battle. Now, here, here's the key, though. Notice what it says. The procession is seen, O God, the procession of who? Of my God. It's not the procession of the Israelites, is it? It's the procession of God. Now, just think about that for, for a moment. Um, various things, and, and I'm sure that you've seen them. You've seen troops come home from, from battle. Desert Storm was one. The war in Iraq was another. World War II was another. And, and World War II, what, what did they have uh, in the streets of major cities when the soldiers came home? You had parades. You had ticker tape parades. What did you say, Gary? You had welcome home, you had all that, and they just, I mean, walking into that, right? I mean, how, how do you think that made them feel? Do you think it made them feel pretty good? It made them feel pretty proud. Um, we're going to get to that. I'm going to tell you why in a second, Gary. We're gonna get to, Gary has to be referred to the ark. We're going to get to that. <laughs> Robert just said easy, big boy. What are you going to say, Gary? You can go ahead. You can go ahead. All right. So, but I want you to think of the victory. Now, here's the other thing, that, and, and I'm going to pick on a battle, no matter what you're politically motivated towards it. Did the folks from Vietnam get that? They didn't. Uh, I, I just happened to see somebody the other day, uh, saw a gentleman, and I saw his hat, and I just pointed at his hat like this, and I said, welcome home, and he stopped. And I thought, oh, no, I know what he's getting ready to do. And I shook his hand, he squeezed my hand tighter, and he said, thank you. Thank you. And I said, welcome home. Welcome home. Because, you know, a long time ago, I used to say thank you for your service to somebody in, in Vietnam. And I talked to somebody, and they said, hey, you know what the best thing you can tell them is? 
I said, what? And he said, you tell them welcome home. You tell every single person welcome home. And he says, when you see your bio, we were, we were talking. We just ran at each other in the store 45 minutes later. Um, and he said, you tell your biological father next time you see him that I told him welcome home. And I thought, I can remember that. And I saw him and I said, hey, I ran into a guy that said welcome home. And his face changed, right? Because it was like somebody said welcome home. But because you, you, there's a difference when there's a victorious parade and procession and when stuff just kind of rolls by. Now, once again, no political affiliation to that. That's just history. That's the way that, that it happened. So here you have this procession. It says, is seen, O God, the procession of my God into the sanctuary. Is God walking, and this is where I was going to mention this, Gary, is God physically walking with him? Then when it says the procession of my God into the sanctuary, what are they talking about? Chances are they're talking about the Ark of the Covenant because where was the dwelling place of God really kind of, we would say, among men outside of the temple or in, even in the temple? In the Ark. So now you've got the victorious scene of the Ark and procession probably leading back to Numbers chapter 10 and it says it's coming into the sanctuary and look at the scene that's here. It says, the singers in front, the musicians last, between them virgins playing tambourines. Bless, uh, bless God in the great congregation, the Lord... Uh, of who you are Israel's fountain. There is Benjamin, the least of them in the lead, the princes of Judah in their throng, the princes of Zebulun, the princes of Naphtali. Picture that for a moment. And if you don't know all the background of the names, picture that. D just, just picture the tribes. Picture people showing up. Do you picture a small crowd or do you picture a pretty big crowd? Picture a big crowd. In, in fact, if you look at it and it says... The singers in front, the musicians in last, between them virgins playing trombones. Just from that scene, you know that something great has happened. You know that this is not a funeral procession. You don't find that at a funeral procession. You, you, you find that at a joyful procession. So here comes God, I believe, to Gary's question, in the form of the ark, in the procession, and you have this, this lead that's happening. Now notice... Verse 28. Verse 28 gives um, a, a request. I have it up here as a request from God, but it gives a request. In fact, let me bump to the slide I want to get to. What does the psalmist, and I'm going to read, uh, by the way, let me read verse 28 through verse 31, then let's come back and talk about it. Uh, it says in verse 28, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It says, Summon your power, O God, the power, O God, by which you have worked for us. Because of your temple at Jerusalem, kings shall bear gifts to you. Rebuke the beasts that dwell among the reeds and the herds and the bulls and the calves of the people. Trample underfoot those who lust after tribute. Scatter the peoples who delight in war. Uh, nobles shall come from Egypt, and Cush shall hasten to stretch forth, stretch out her hands to God. The, the beginning of this verse, or this passage, this section here, um, in the English Standard Version, it says summon. Who has a different word than Summon. Verse 24, uh, sorry, verse 28, 28, sorry, I said 24. English Standard Version says, summon your power, O God. Command, order up. What, what does it mean when you hear the word summon, or do you hear the word order up, or you hear command? What does the psalmist want God to do? He wants him to show it. That's, that's what it boils down to. He's shown it, and there's this procession that's there, and he wants God to, to really to display his power again. There, there's this request from the psalmist to show his power. And look at what he says. Summon your power, O God, the power by which you have worked for us. What, what's the power that God has worked for the, for the hearers, the listeners of that? Okay. Okay. Okay? Okay, so you, you go back to the very beginning. Got him out of Egypt. And I'm going to say very beginning. We're just going to go back to Exodus for a second. Got him out of Egypt. Got him across the Red Sea. Got him to Canaan. They did what they did. Got him through the wilderness. Led him, to, led him into the land. Took care of him, not only in protection, but sustained them with food. Provided them what they needed. So was God's power working for the Israelites? Daily. 
So once again, so if you think, okay, what's the power they worked for us? Go back to verse 19. We're, I'm going to draw a couple connections ro just real quick. Verse 19, it says, blessed be the Lord who daily does what? He, he bears us up. Okay, so God's working for us. God's taking care of us. Jump back to, if I just can, to verse 7. Oh God, when you went out before your people, is maybe what Gary was referring to about the wilderness, you marched through the wilderness. God, God was with them. Verse 5, the fatherless of the fatherless, the protector of widows in his holy habitation. You, this psalm is about God being there for them. But God being there in those moments. It's very interesting. When I ask what your favorite song is and where do you see yourself, you know, in, in, in our songbook, or maybe not even in our songbook, and you see yourself sometimes and you captivate that, that song, it's because you've got a little bit of history in it. You know, you've got a little bit of history in it. Um, you know, like I'll share one for me. It may not be for you. One of mine... It's the good old standard song. It's called different time, different things in different books. Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. Anybody ever feel like that? That's, that was one when I was little. I like, I like this song. I like the words of the song. Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. Why? Why? You know, kind of almost at times going back to what I mentioned on Sunday morning about uh, Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19. He's in the cave. God says, why are you here? Look at everything I've done. And that's, that's what he says. And God says, you still got a plan. Let's get up and go. It, it, and it, it kind of means something. Um, I, I remember we had a, a, a guy at the congregation, one of the congregations I was at, always led the old rugged cross. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you've been. I would probably guarantee he led it 10 times slower than anything you've ever heard. He would start it, and after he was done singing it, we would just have an invitation and go home. It was one of those. But he sang it, and you could hear it through every word. Now, most of the time we were going, we're going, come on, let's go. We got it. We got to be there, right? But it was just, it was, but that was his song. And you know what, when you asked him, he said, why is it the old rugged cross? Pretty much he said this, he hung there for me. And it was like, all right, uh, we can't, we can't tell you no at this point, right? It's just that, that's the song. So when the psalmist is writing this, and once again, let's, let's, you probably go back to above verse one, it says the Psalm of David. We're going to throw in a pretty interesting thing here in a second. Probably a psalm of David, once in the summer is summon his power, which they've worked before the people, which they've seen, they have a history of God working through that. But notice the next verse, verse 29. It's a very interesting word. It says, because your temple at Jerusalem, kings shall bear gifts to you. Who wrote the psalm? David. Who built the temple? Solomon. So, what's David mean if it's David? You see what I'm getting at? If David wrote it, David hadn't seen the temple, but David writes about the temple in Jerusalem. Did you ever notice that when we read through it? Anybody got a thought? Who here doesn't have a thought? I mean, like at all. Okay. From your temple because of, but still has temple in it. Um, here's what's interesting. When we hear the word temple in the Old Testament, what do we think of? We think of the physical Jewish temple. What does temple mean? I mean, temple, temple means temple. But, but, 
Okay, it's a place of worship. What else when you hear the word temple? Okay. All right, you got... Okay, the center of the Jewish... Okay, the center of everything about Judaism. Okay. What else when you think of temple? All right, our body is a temple. New Testament reference, our body is a temple. Okay. What else when we hear temple? What do you think of? House of God? Is that what you said, Kip? Okay. Um, is the temple a holy place? When, when, yeah, for the Jews it was. When we get down to it, we, we think of temple, and, and I'm not trying to be semantical, and I'm not trying to split words, but you start thinking of a holy place. Okay, we immediately kind of lock in a little bit to Solomon's temple. Okay, now once again, David's under inspiration here, by the way. But, you know, the temple also has to do with a place that is holy or holy place. David? Okay. Yes. Mm hmm mm hmm Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Dave was mentioning, you know, the story of the ark. The Philistines had it, end up leaving at guy's house for, for or lit in, in a, uh, oh, I just forgot the place David said it. It starts with a B. What was it? Where they left it for years, started with a B. You, Benadab, yeah. They left it in his house, you know, blessed, it, it just blessed them. They, you know, they brought the ark back, and that's the procession. He's talking about the procession that came in. But it, it's interesting, as it's coming in, right, the dwelling place of God is in the, is in the ark. The temple's not there yet. The tabernacle, remember the tabernacle? You know, we, we're talking about that. What did David want to build? He wanted to build the temple. So you've got this. Yeah, he's got, he's got a plan. God's plan is different. <laughs> but, you know, when you talk about a temple, we're talking about this holy place, and it's going to be this that the that it's going to be brought into. I think it's very interesting. To, we typically, and I'm going to say this very nonchalant in a lot of ways, and I don't want to offend anybody. Most people who've grown up in the churches of Christ, we hear the temple and we think Solomon's temple or Herod's temple. I have some friends who grew up going to temple, okay, of the Jewish persuasion. You know what that temple was to them? It was a building, but they were taught growing up, that's the holy place. Now, Jerusalem's a holy place, but this is, this is our holy place. They were going to temple. They were going to the holy place. So there's this richness of meaning. So when it says that the, um, because you're, of your temple in Jerusalem or from your temple at Jerusalem, from this holy place, it says kings shall bear gifts to you. Why are kings bearing gifts to God? Okay, the recognition of who God is as being the most high. Fear, fear. 
You know, and, and it ha I think it has to do with fear because you recognize there's somebody higher than you, higher than, 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 who, than who you are. David? Mm -hmm. Yeah, four. Okay, David, David made the connection I was going to mention and ask. Da David made it. If, if you take a look at King's Bear Gifts to You, go backwards to where I mentioned in verse 18, and this is verse 18 comes from Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8. Remember we talked about this at the very, very beginning, and I said this is where many people think it has to do, you know, there, there's that New Testament connection. The understanding is, Notice what it says. You ascended on high, leading the host of captives in your train, receiving gifts among men, even from the rebellious that the Lord may dwell there. So then, after this, this victory uh, procession, verse 29, the king shall bear gifts to you. This is tied with the victory of God. That's where this is tied to. This, this giving of gifts is tied to the, victor, the victorious, victorious nature of God. So even in Ephesians, I, I think it, it still applies. Y you have some victorious n uh, nature of God that's there, but he's giving gifts among the men because God is victorious. Very interesting. Uh, just track through Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, we find out that we were once dead. We've made made, been made alive with our trespasses and sins. Chapter 3 of Ephesians, it says that there's, a, there's this mystery that's been hidden for the ages, and that's the gospel. And the gospel has made us victorious. You get into chapter 4, here's the things that are victorious at the very beginning. And by the way, God's given you gifts. So with a victory over sin, there's a gift. With a victory over God, there's a gift. It, it's, it's very kind of crazy to look at. I, I don't think it's a stretch that when there's a victory, there, there's the spoils. I think that's the word David said. There's the spoils. There's the, the gifts that are given. As people that have been victorious over sin, we've been given some gifts. We've been, we've been given some things. Uh, the purpose of those in Ephesians 4 is for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. That the body may grow up together in love and each part working where each part needs to work. Fascinating. What's that? Not, not with David. Not this temple. Yep, not this temple. It's not even built yet. So this, is, so this idea of the temple is the holy place of God, where all this is going to happen. But notice verse 30. I told you to hold on to this verse. It says, Rebuke the beasts that dwell among the reeds, the herds of bulls with the calves of the people. Trample underfoot those who lust after tribute. Scatter the peoples who delight in war. Because nobles shall come from Egypt. Cush uh, shall hasten and stretch out her hands to God. What's it have to do with the animals? Why does it say, rebuke the beasts of the field that dwell among the reeds, the herds of the bulls with the calves of the peoples? What's the significance of animals in the Old Testament with people? That's a weird question, isn't it? Okay, could be there's an association that has to do with he's moving into Egypt and the Cush. It could be that. Could be kind of the illustration that's given. It, it's very interesting because I, I've, I've looked this up with people who are so much smarter than I am. And, and some people will say, you know what? The beasts that dwell among the reeds, probably talking about crocodiles, the herds of the bulls, the calves of the people, those are things that are going to be found in Egypt and, and in Cush. The, the other side of it is, people will go over to Jonah chapter, um, should be Jonah chapter, chapter 3. Sorry, got a little confused there. Uh, in Jonah chapter 3, when the people of Nineveh repent, who repents in Nineveh? The people repent, right? What happens to the animals? You remember? To me, that's one of the funniest parts of that story. It may not be funny to you, it's funny to me. Um, it says this, 
It says, when the, word of the, when the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself in sackcloth, set in ashes, issued a proclamation to be published through Nineveh. And here's the decree. It says, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast nor herd nor flock or taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered in sackcloth and let them call out mightily to their God. Now, I, I think, and, and hopefully... I'm thinking the right way. I don't think the animals are going to call out to God. But, but what's, the, what's the symbolism in that? Symbolism is from the greatest to the lowest. Everybody in Nineveh recognized God. Like the whole nation's changed. So when, when you get into rebuke the beast, the herds trample underfoot, those who lust after tributes, all that, is, is this talking about Egypt and Cush? Or is this symbolic of Egypt and Cush and the land that's around moving into Africa? You know, because once again, we're in Jerusalem talking about the temple, talking about the holy place of God, talking about where God's going to dwell in the ark. And it, it's moving to the land of Egypt, which, by the way, does Israel have a his, history with Egypt? Does Israel have a history? I'm going to be in a lump sum here. Does Israel have a history with Africa? They've got a history. So now moving down into, into this section. But notice what he's saying. He's saying they're going to, these nobles are going to come from Egypt. The people who delight in, the English Standard Version says delight in war. It's almost an unknown phrase there. Um, that there's some discussion as to what that means. But it, it says for all these people, they're going, to, they're going to go away. They're going to be trampled underfoot. But the nobles are going to come, and Cush is going to hasten to stretch out their hand. There's an acknowledgement. This is what I want you to remember because it can get kind of confusing. This is what I want you to remember. There's an acknowledgement of God by the nations, by the people. Now, how do those people acknowledge God? Do you think they heard about God and saw God's power? I mean, did Egypt hear about God and see God's power? You know, they, I think they did. You know, do, do we see God's power at work within us today? We, we do. Do you know one of the reasons that a lot of fundamentalist nations hate Western civilization? One of them, not, there's many, but one, it's considered to be a Christian nation. Now, we can parse that term all we want, but just the thought of it being a nation that follows Christ is upsetting to some. So, it, it, that's part of it. That's why in, uh, in Surah chapter 3 of the Quran, it talks about kill the infidels. Very, I probably just got muted on YouTube, but probably very an interesting point to consider. David, your hand go up. Okay. Okay. David mentioned, you know, the idea of the beast and the bulls, symbol, symbol of power. You know, then the idea of, you know, trampling her foot, scaling those people. You know, it has to do, you know, going back to the victorious nature of, of, of what's happening. Uh, that was interesting. Uh, <laughs> somebody drove by with a really interesting radio. All right, uh, verse 32 through 35. I'm going to read it really quick. It says, Kings, O kingdoms of the earth, sing to God, sing praises to the Lord. To him who rides in the heaven, the ancient of heavens, behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice. Ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel, whose power is in the skies. Awesome from his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. That's the ultimate praise that the psalm is going to close in. From the very beginning, O kingdoms of the earth. Now notice, there's a difference in, in, in the idea of of Israel and kingdoms of the earth. This is a generalized idea. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, it says, sing to God, sing praises to the Lord. From him who rides in the heaven, the ancient heavens, the idea that God's always been in the heavens, that God's always been there. In fact, when many people think about crying out to God, where do they look? 
they look up. Even, even if you watch some anti-religious movie, they cry out to God. Where do they look? They look up because we, we have this, this idea. But it says, he who rides in the heaven, the ancient of heavens, behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice. Now, who's going to, who's going to see this heavens and, and understand this mighty voice or hear this mighty voice? Go back to, the, to verse 32. It's the kingdoms of the earth. It's not just Israel because they've seen God's power. Read, kind of read the sections backwards. That's why he's victorious. That's why there's been gifts. That's why there's been spoils because of the victorious nature of God because he's conquered the enemies. He's been able to do that. Now, at the end, it says, Ascribe power to God whose majesty is over Israel, whose power is in the skies. Then it says, Awesome is God from his sanctuary. Who has a different word than awesome? Anybody have the word reverent? What? Holy. Okay, holy place. But awesome is God from his sanctuary, from his holy place. He says, The God of Israel, he is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. So among all the things that the psalmist sees and the psalmist experiences in this nature of battle, he gets to the end and he says, all the kingdoms need to praise God. He's watching over Israel. So let me give you one more thought before we, before we close. The first thought of getting to the end of that psalm where it's the praise, and I know this is kind of like a duh statement, all right? Um, the getting to the end, go back to verse 1. And, and this, is, this is what I call in my life, I, I call this one of those, those buckle-up verses. And this is what I mean. What's the psalmist ask God to do? He, the very first one, not, not just to scatter him, but what's he asked him to do before that? He asked God to get up. He says, arise. Get up, let, let's, let, let's go. Now, do we ask God to do that? We ask God to heal people, right? And I just did it in prayer. We ask God to watch over us and to protect us. Do we ask God to, to give us opportunities? You know, if we ask God for an opportunity, that's one of those we better buckle up kind of things because we don't know, we don't know what that opportunity is going to be, do we? So when you think about this, and that's, this is what I want you to take home from this psalm. You see the history of Israel. You see all that. It, it's just like, and I told you we're going to refer to the plagues a whole lot. The children of Israel asked God to come and save them, didn't they? When they were in, Is, when, I mean, when they were in Egypt, the, the children of God asked God to come and save them, didn't they? They wanted God to come and save them. God sent Moses, and what'd they do? This, and I'm going to paraphrase, Chris Gallagher version. This old guy? The, him? Wait, wait a second. That's not who we wanted. That's not who we thought. When, when, when the, the, the children of, of Israel, when they wanted the Messiah, and they, they asked God to send, to send a Messiah, and they waited on the Messiah, who did God send? God sent Jesus through a little, tiny, know-nothing town called Bethlehem. And he changed the entire world. And were they ready for him? They weren't ready for him. So the reason I say that is you look at all the things that God has done and go back to verse 1. When we ask God to move, I think we have to be ready for God to move. And I think when we're ready for God to move and when God does move, I think we celebrate that moment. Last night, um, you guys can come on in if you want to. Last night, I got to celebrate with some friends of mine uh, because we have been praying that his wife would be cancer-free right now. She had some stuff show up on a test. Went through a barrage of tests, came back yesterday. They sat in a doctor's office. The doctor looked at them and said, I got, I got good news and bad news. And they said, what's the good news? And they said, well, what do you want first? They said, what's the good news? And they said, here's the good news. It's nothing. It's nothing. He said, what's the bad news? He said, the bad news is you had to come here and we had to do all these things and take out half your day. And they said, we'll do it every time. So when we ask God to do something, we have to be ready to celebrate, even with, and I'm going to put a caveat on this for a minute and ask you to come back Sunday morning, even when we don't understand. If God moves, we need to celebrate. So here's where we're going to be next week. 
Next week, we are going to hit the largest psalm in psalms. Psalm 119. I do not think that we're going to get through it next week. But we'll give it our best effort. But thank you for being here. Uh, the Sydney Jacks want to come up and lead us in singing here in a few moments. Then I'll have a quick devotional. But thank you for being here. Good evening. Heard that. Uh, I just want to share a thought with you really quick regarding our Family and Friends Day that's coming up April 14th. If you have not grabbed a card, grab one of those and, and take, it, take it with you. Um, a few weeks ago, actually a few months ago, uh, Jimmy Simmons wore Jim Craig's hockey jersey and several people came up and said, hey, you, get, you talked about hockey like, like you knew what it was. And, and did you guys set that up? No, we did not set that up. Uh, hockey is just a sport that I really like because hockey is very hard. Uh, hockey is very hard to understand. Hockey doesn't make sense. Why would somebody get on ice in the first place? That's what a lot of people ask. But hockey has the ability, and it's a very, very quick game, to take this small little thing called a puck and to hit it with a stick, and that, that puck will travel anywhere from 91 to about 120 miles an hour. And what's very interesting is you have to get it by this person in this little goal. And there's a lot of ways that you can try to do that. But one of the best of all time was a man by the name of Wayne Gretzky. Wayne Gretzky, many people know the name. He scored 894 goals during his career. 
the total number of points that he was able to score was somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,857 points, I believe that it is. Points is a, uh, you add the goals and the assists together and, and you, get, you get the points. So Wayne Gretzky was able to do that. And when Wayne was asked by a reporter, he said, how did you score so many goals? And he gave the best possible answer that's still used today to train young hockey players on how to score a goal. Step one is you go to where the puck is. Now that seems way too simple, right? You go to where the puck is. He said, because the first thing you have to do to be able to score goals, you have to have the puck. You have to have that little, that little black thing that's about this tall. It's going to travel pretty fast. You've got to find it, and you've got to go to where the puck is. So here's what I want you to think about. A lot of Christianity is about people coming to us. But evangelism is when we go to where the souls are where we go outside of this building to share the light of Christ with the people around us. It's really hard to grow if we don't go to where the people are. Now, just take for a moment, if you're reading through our gospel accounts, as you read through those, you're reading through the life of Jesus. As you read through towards, the, towards this, this week and the next week and the, the few days after, ask yourself this question, where did Jesus go? And who did Jesus talk to? Well, the answer is Jesus talked to everybody. Jesus talked to people that he didn't even know. Jesus talked to people that he knew. But Jesus went to where the people are. So at the end of Matthew chapter 9, as Jesus looks to the people, Jesus has compassion on them. Because he sees they are a, they're like sheep without a shepherd. Nobody's guiding them. Nobody's leading them. And they look lost. And they look dazed. And they look confused. And Jesus says, pray that the Lord of heart, pray that the Lord is going to send forth people. Because the laborers are few, but the harvest is many. He says, pray that they're going to send them into the harvest. We can't wait for people to come to us. We need to go to where the people are. Just as Wayne Gretzky, very, very simply, Top, one of the top goal scorers of all time said you have to go to where the puck is. We need to go where the people are. I would encourage you as you think about who to invite, who to invite to this building, you must go to where the people are. Something to think about today, but if you're here and you need prayers of the church, if you're here, if you're here and you need to be baptized for mission of your sins or further study, we'll do anything that we can to help you this evening. But if you want to make that known by coming to this spot, you can do that while together we stand and as we sing. Timothy East. Uh, Timothy fell and broke his arm and suffered a concussion, so he's going to be having surgery on March 29th. So if we all remember Timothy in your prayers.
And we've been asked to pray for a young lady named Taylor, so I would just encourage you uh, to pray about her situation. God knows all of those things, but she's asked us uh, as a church to pray for her, so we, we offer uh, that an opportunity for you to pray for her as well. Uh, a week from today, we're going to have a Life South blood drive. Several people have asked about that. That will be out in our parking lot at 1 o'clock a week from today. Uh, there's a lot of announcements in the bulletin as well. and encourage you to grab uh, those as well. But that's all the announcements that I do have. Uh, please continue. Remember Timothy and Tyler. Oh, yes, and Jan needs to meet. Sorry, my notes over there. Jan needs to meet with all the uh, elementary age teachers, Bible class teachers up front, uh, if you will, or in this section over here where she's at uh, following services. So I think that's all I was handed that I forgot. What's her name again? Miss Crow. Crow. So remember her in your prayers um, as well. In fact, let's bow in a moment of prayer uh, if we can. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for loving us and caring for us. Father, thank you for allowing us to be here. And as we bring these names before you, as, as we bring Timothy East and Miss Crow and, and Taylor, Father, we pray that you will watch over them, that you would, uh, your shining hand of, of healing and your peace and your calm would be upon them as well. And Father, help us to be the lights that we can be. Help us to be examples and encourage them in each and every way that we can. Thank you for loving us today and thank you for being very present in our lives. We ask all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Jack. Just saying this. Uh... Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this beautiful day that we've been allowed and for the opportunity to come here and study thy word. And we ask that you would be with our elders <coughs> and help them with the, de the decisions they have to make and may they be pleasing to thee. Also, we ask that you would be with those that have been mentioned as being sick and having health issues and be with Timothy East and help him to heal quickly. Also be with the teachers and students and Josh and watch over them and protect them. Also we ask that you be with us in the coming days and bring us back at the next appointed time and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> 